Hey guys, it's Julie here. Uh, Happy New Year. This is the first podcast of 2022, which is such a crazy thing to think about. But speaking of new, you might notice that we have a new name. It is no longer Tux Time. Uh, I just let my dog outside so he doesn't hear me saying this. Um, He'd be devastated if he knew, but it is now what's happening in fintech today just to keep things more simple Um, If someone wants to search for the podcast, it'll be a lot easier to find There will still always be a link on our website fintechtoday.co to go right to it Otherwise, you should also subscribe on Spotify Apple Podcasts, whatever platform that you use But without further ado, we need to get into our first episode of the new year Jeff Seibert of digits. I am excited to have him on today Uh, Jeff, you have co-founded a couple of companies before, um, Digit being the recent one. Uh, Talk to me a little bit about why you want to focus so much on small business, because it seems like the other ones that you have started in the past also had this area of expertise, and then how Digit is aiming to help the small business space. Yeah, well, first off, it's really great to be here. Thank you so much. Um, Really appreciate the opportunity. And that is a great question. And I care deeply about small businesses. Um, I think I started my first true company when I was 13. I was literally writing Mac desktop shareware in the early 90s, mid 90s. Um, (laughs) Forget the lemonade stands or anything. I also, I did have a lemonade stand. That is true as well. I didn't incorporate that one though. Um, But I've just been obsessed with entrepreneurship for literally as long as I can remember. And I love sort of, Two things. One, helping people save time. I felt like as someone who's passionate in business and passionate about coding, I just never felt like I had enough hours in the day. And so I've always wanted to save myself time and by extension, other business owners time. Um, And then I also just feel this responsibility to bring really good software to work. Like, why is it that when you go home at night, okay, you have your phone and these great apps and these fun experiences. And then if you go to work in the day, everything you interact with is just horribly designed and built. And so the opportunity to just bring really thoughtful, beautiful, almost software to small businesses is something I get really excited about. So what are the, what's sort of the sweet spot in small businesses that use you guys? Because as we know, like a small business ranges so much in size, demographic, what they do, uh, what, what area gets the most benefit from using digits? It is a wide range. We have obviously a bunch of technology startups on Digits today. We also have hundreds of true small businesses, interior design firms, restaurants, doctor's offices. Um, And this is really core to our belief. We're not building this for any one vertical or one industry. It's really just meant to help you run your business, whatever kind of business that is. And we took the same approach at Crashlytics. So Crashlytics was a developer tool, but it wasn't designed for one type of app. It was designed to help every app serve this very generic problem of whether their app was crashing or not. And we had customers literally from high school and college students all the way to Twitter and Uber using the exact same product. When did you um, found Digit? Who are some of your backers? And, you know, what are you guys using that funding for now? Is it expanding into new areas? Is it hiring? Like, what's next? Yeah, so we started Digits uh, in mid-2018, and we were initially raised an A round from Benchmark. We've since uh, raised and announced a Series B from GV, um, and we are fortunate. We have tons of investor support. We have years of runway, which is very uh, fortunate to be able to say as a startup. And so we're not using the capital for any particular expansion. It's more so that we can give confidence to the industry that we're not going anywhere, that we're very committed to this for the long run, and we're really committed to the software we're building and offering to the market to help all these businesses. You know, going through the pandemic and everything too, I'm sure, you know, a number of the small businesses that you guys help were impacted quite a bit. How did that shape what you guys were working on and how you were able to, you know, try to act quickly to help these companies? Yeah, it really was a dramatic change. So I think back to February of 2020, and we started seeing those early signs that, oh, this was going to be a pretty big deal. And we ended up actually pivoting our focus a little bit. So we had been building a pretty generic dashboard that showed expenses and revenue and cash flow and all these different things. And in order to accelerate our launch, our our first beta launch, we decided let's just focus on expenses because we got the hunch that all of these companies were cutting costs and were dealing with prices they didn't expect and so on. And so our first beta that we launched that spring was only expenses. Um, But it was really well received, and we actually heard some amazing stories. 
So a surgeon in San Diego found digits and started using it for his practice. And he said this was the first time he felt like he had real time understanding. And he was he it turned out last summer he almost went bankrupt because the cost of PPE spiked 10 times. And he's a surgeon. He's buying it routinely for his practice. And he didn't realize that cost impact without digits alerting him to it. And he could see it as it happened rather than waiting a month or a month and a half later for the books to come in. So how, um, you know, does that impact what products and services you guys will offer now on? Because things are starting to get a little bit better. I don't want to jinx that we have Omicron and everything, but it feels like you can start shifting your focus again back to things that you perhaps had to put on the wayside to focus so much on the expenses, like you mentioned. That's exactly right. And so now we've stepped back and we're rebroadening the platform. We did a big launch this summer of a product called Digit Search, and it's just real-time search at your fingertips, and it's your entire company's finances. So not just expenses, but also revenue and cash flow and equities and everything that touches your business, you can really pull up in a second with search. I'm looking at your website here, and I love the tagline that you have. Technology is so powerful, you think you, we stole it from the future. Uh, and I bring that up just because a lot of the things that I think are so like futuristic now are things like DeFi and crypto, mm -hmm. Web3. What are you guys doing in that space, and how are you looking at it, how it might impact small businesses? Because I think a lot of times us as consumers think about how it can impact us as individuals versus the companies that we're interacting with. Yeah, great question. So by tech we're stealing from the future, it's not actually the crypto or DeFi side. We haven't gotten into that <laughs> space yet. Um, what we mean is the first real implementation of a true real-time uh, finance model. And so what we, we call this our living model. And when you think about it, you as a small business owner, you start the company, you have no choice to, but to go hire an accountant. They're going to do your books. And then you might work with them or an external CFO to start putting together a model of your business. And that's how you'll start planning. And what we've been really focused on for three years now, since 2018, is can we in an automated manner build a model of your business and can we do it in real time with every single transaction? And it turns out technically that's really, really hard to do. And so we are uh, building and deploying true deep learning models. They're running in production. They're trained online with every transaction. And I know machine learning and AI have sort of mixed reputations in different circles, we are one of the few that are actually using them to improve the product experience and doing it with the user's focus in mind, not with the goal of like, oh, let's replace you with a model. That is not going to happen. Our mindset is how can we use this to take some of the tedium out and give you a really good, interesting product experience? You mentioned that one story where the, the surgeon was close to going bankrupt and hadn't realized that they were spending so much on PPE because the costs had gone up so much with the supply chain issues, other inflation worries and whatnot. What else have you guys seen on the platform? And, you know, I made the assumption that small businesses are recovering and things are getting better. Are you actually seeing that in your data or am I wrong in that assumption at this point? I, I think it definitely depends on the sector, but I would say broadly things are recovering and we've seen a huge spike in new business formation, um, which is another super interesting thing. So of course, early during COVID, a lot of businesses shut down and failed. Um, now people are back at it and are very optimistic and are starting new companies. And so we're just seeing a bunch of brand new businesses join digits, uh, which is really fun, literally with just days or weeks of transaction history. And so that's a really great sign. Um, but yeah, I think people will continue to struggle in some regions. Supply chain disruptions are definitely real. And so it really depends on the type of business you're running. Are there ways that you guys could help with supply chain issue type things? Like I'm just spitballing here a little bit too. That seems like it might be a little out there versus like an accounting thing. But you know, uh, you got your, you're futuristic. So maybe there is a way that I haven't thought of yet that you have. Yeah, for, for those listening, if you have an idea, I would love to hear it. Uh, we have been focused more on the accounting side. Um, and I would say it's really real time is a big deal because if you put yourself in the business owner's shoes, the industry average is a 15 to 21 day close. So by the time November ends, right, it's going to be two and a half, maybe three weeks before they get the books. And so that's really been our focus is how can we pull down that window? So literally in the moment, you can see what's happening. And I think even if we can't help with the supply chain issue, at least we can show you the impact really in the moment. As a small business owner, kind of myself with FinTech today, 
oh, what's going to be different with me using digits versus someone like a Stripe or a Mercury or a Row or a Brex? Because they offer some of these things too. Like you're listing some things off and I can think of ways that they help with that. But it's definitely a different model that the way that they do it versus the way that you guys are. Correct. And most of those platforms you mentioned are financial services. So whether you're using Stripe to accept your payments or banking with Mercury or whatever it might be, um, they see their data. They don't see the other sides of your business. And so we've intentionally taken what I sort of call a Switzerland approach, right? Like we're neutral. We see everything. We connect to 11,000 different banks and institutions via Plaid. We connect directly into your core ledger on QuickBooks. And so it doesn't matter where the money's coming or going. Um, we see all of it to give you a holistic picture of your business. Why, why do you think that that's the better approach to the one that these other guys are going with? More so not just as like a business standpoint, but like from your end, like a revenue, cash flow, that kind of standpoint. Yeah, because I think it's unrealistic that you can capture 100% of a business's activity. Like you're going to have a customer want to pay via check or you need to send an invoice and they're going to pay you in cash for some reason, right? Like these edge cases are going to happen. And the moment you don't have a complete picture, it's actually not very useful, right? And so that was pretty fundamental to how we wanted to build it. It's like we need to see everything so that then you can trust that you're seeing everything. Taking it back to where we started the podcast, this is not the first startup that you have co-founded. Talk to me a little bit about reasons that you've you know, moved on to the next thing and lessons that you've learned in that process too, because there's a lot of people that are either currently founders or have ambitions to be founders at one point listening to this podcast. Yeah, great question. As a, so a quick story, Digits is my third startup. My first one was a company called Encreo back in 2007. Uh, we were acquired by Box. Uh, it was uh, Box's first ever acquisition. And then I started Crashlytics in 2011. And we were acquired by Twitter in 2013. Um, and in both of those, uh, in Creo, we, that we were first-time founders, we made every mistake in the book, um, including filing, file, uh, filing our taxes on the wrong date because we thought they were due in <laughs> April, not March. Um, and so I'd say the big lessons learned through that time are a real focus on distribution is you can build a great product. But if you don't have a strategy for how to get it out into the market and introduce the market to it, it becomes a really difficult thing to scale. And that is something we got fortunate with and did very, very well at Crashlytics. We, have, we probably spent more time focused on distribution than we did actually the core product engineering. And that is what allowed us to impact so many people. And so at Crashlytics, we went from zero to 300 million devices in one year. Today, Crashlytics runs on 6 billion MAU, so it's on effectively every active smartphone on earth. Um, and I give that credit really to our focus on how do we scale this, how do we get it out, and how do we incentivize one mobile app developer to tell the other, and so on and so on. And so I won't go into our secrets for digits, but we are really thinking about this on the digits side too. And how do we make accounting software spread? Feels counterintuitive. But if we can make accounting software really fun and it motivates business owners to spread the word and talk about it, then that'll be great for us. What about an exit strategy for digits? I mean, you guys are still fairly young and everything, but would you be looking more at an M&A path like you've had before? Do you think this could be big enough to IPO? Um, I, I'm sure you, even though it's a ways off, probably you, you think about that. Yeah, for sure. And so Wayne, my co-founder, and I uh, started and sold Crashlytics together. We have seen that movie. I think that there are certain benefits to it, but no, our ambition for digits is we believe this should be huge. Every business on earth could benefit from better real-time intelligence. And so we're really excited to just keep building this product and make this as big of a company as we can. You mentioned some of the challenges you went through with the previous companies. What are the challenges that keep you up at night with digits? Is it um, you know, being able to hire the right people? Is it regulation? Is it getting the word out to more small businesses? Is it the potential of another COVID happening? Like, mm -hmm. what, what is your biggest concern right now? All of those are definitely risks. Um, I would say the hiring market is incredibly tight right now, as you've probably been hearing. Mm -hmm. uh, but we are fortunate we have a really strong core team. And so we're actually pretty good in that shape. I'd say the biggest just sort of ongoing discovery we have is the depth of complexity in business finance 
and even some things aren't well settled. So some company will do their books one way for a reason, and another company will choose a totally different reason, which might work for them, but from the software side, we need to understand and support that. And so just the sort of endless discovery of additional edge cases and additional patterns continues to be a tax we have to pay as we build out and mature the product. And so that's probably the biggest risk is can we just make sure we're handling everything correctly as we scale the number of businesses on digits. And you mentioned that you are pretty good in the hiring spot right now. Which areas are you hiring for, though, in case someone on here wants to look at careers at Digit? Yes, that'd be great. Um, so, of course, always hiring engineers. Um, but I think more urgent for us right now is we're looking for uh, additional really great product managers and product designers. Uh, you may see from our website, we take a very design first approach to building. Uh, we have an immersive dark mode experience. And that carries through to the product. So the feel of the product very much matches what you see on digits.com. And so we're looking for really great PMs and designers to help us scale this even further. And one other thing you mentioned was that you use Plaid for integrating a bunch of the data. There's been issues around data connectivity in the past, with privacy laws and whatnot. I'm sure it's a little bit different for small businesses than individuals, but is that a part of your concern at all? It is for sure. And so last year we joined FDX, the financial data exchange. We are huge fans of open banking and secure APIs. I am really pleased to see that Plaid has more recently started pushing stuff towards more secure connections, true partnerships with these financial institutions. And so I think the industry is moving in the right direction. It just takes time and we're doing what we can to motivate these different institutions to adopt more modern standards. Um, because I, I will say three years ago when we started this, there were some real security problems with how people connected to banks. And that's starting to get better, which is great. It brings me back to some of the stuff that's happening in crypto right now, too, because I feel like every single time I write a newsletter over the past couple of weeks, there's another crypto hack. Right. And it feels like crypto is sort of in a little bit of that space right now. And I kind of wonder how they'll end up being able to fix that in the future. Um, if they will be like a plaid for crypto or if that literally will be plaid or or what that might be too. Yeah, and it's interesting because of course, in the in the sort of fiat world, let's say you typo a wire and you send the wire to the wrong address, which does happen in business quite a bit, mm -hmm. you can actually recall the wire. Versus in crypto, it is gone. And so I think as more and more gets built on top of these uh, chains and technologies, there'll need to be a bit more infrastructure in place to connect to them and to unfortunately recall transactions that weren't intended. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. And I know um, we, we bought a house a few months ago and they were so adamant, like, make sure you get the right like address and everything for the wire. Like our agent told us it like 10 times. And we're like, OK. And they're like, call, don't do it over email, like get the address, confirm it before you send it, everything. And I mean, businesses don't have time to do that and every single wire and everything. So right. it, it's a good thing they can recall it if they need to versus if they were all of a sudden going to be paying each other in Solana or Ethereum or whatever it might be. It, it's a different story. You might get lucky and they'll send it back, but that's that's what you're hoping for. <laughs> well, and, and you were lucky. I have a friend where it was actually his realtor gave him the wrong wire details oh, no. for the buyer. <laughs> And, uh, or sorry, for the seller. And they ended up fixing it, but it took a couple of days. And it's like, yeah. that would have been a disaster. Yeah, it's not a small chunk of money, no matter how big or small the house is. So. Right. <laughs> um, well, Jeff, thank you so much for joining us. If people want to stay up to date on what you and Digits are up to, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, so we are on Twitter at Digits. I'm on Twitter at Jeff Seibert. We also have a blog. And uh, one quick thing, we recently launched a developer blog. So we have developer.digits.com and we have a bunch of stuff there on how we built our search architecture, how we're doing our deep learning and transformer model training, which is pretty cool. Um, so highly encourage people checking those out. If you want to geek out over that over the holidays, be my guy, you know, take a break from the family, go geek out on some technology stuff. There you go. <laughs> That's perfect. Um, and it if you want to stay up to date on all things fintech, fintechtoday.co, sign up for the newsletter, stay up to date on what Digits and others in this space are doing. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Happy holidays in the meantime, and we'll have to keep in touch in 2022. Awesome, Julie. Thank you so much, and happy holidays.